Some call it bootlegging. Some call it racketeering. I call it a business. They say I violate the prohibition law. Who doesn't? All I ever did was sell beer and whiskey to our best people. All I ever did was to supply a demand that was pretty popular. Why, the very guys that made my trade good are the ones that yell loudest at me. Some of the leading judges use the stuff. They talk about me not being on the legitimate. Nobody's on the legit. Al Capone. Capone becomes really famous for the first time in the summer of 1926. It's after the murder of Billy McSwiggin, a prosecutor. And this is a crime that really outrages everybody. I mean, it gets national publicity, and Capone is the first person blamed for it. He hides out for a while, and he comes back to town and says, I'll answer all the questions you've got. I didn't do it. Billy McSwiggin was a friend of mine. In fact, I was paying him. He was on the, my payroll, as if that explains everything. Al Capone, the big-time Chicago bootlegger and gangster, had not wanted the prosecutor killed. His trigger men were trying to hit the mobsters walking next to McSwiggin, who had gone to school with him. Two of them had also died. Capone was never charged. The peace among the city's various ethnic neighborhood gangs, Capone and his mentor, Johnny Torrio, had carefully negotiated back in 1921 had not lasted very long. The big profits to be made from hijacking each other's shipments of beer and liquor proved too tempting. So all the gangsters who had their own neighborhoods in Chicago started vying for the work in their territories. Well, the strong won out, and they ended up with the district. And the weak ended up in the cemetery. Dion O'Banion, the head of one gang, became worried that the Italians, including Capone and Torrio, were conspiring against the Irish and decided to double-cross them. When O'Banion learned that the police were planning to raid his biggest illegal brewery, he kept it to himself and told Torrio and Capone he wanted out of the business and was willing to sell it to them for half a million dollars. When Torrio arrived to take possession, the police descended and arrested him and a number of his men. O'Banion's head, Capone said, got away from his hat. A few months later, as O'Banion was working in his flower shop, two gunmen shot him dead. Capone denied any connection to that crime, too, and sent a huge bouquet to the funeral. But O'Banion's henchmen, Jaime Weiss and George Bugs Moran swore vengeance. The Chicago Beer Wars had begun. When someone shot up Capone's car, he ordered himself a seven-ton bulletproof Cadillac. Weiss and Moran then shot Johnny Torrio as he returned from shopping with his wife. Torrio was hit five times. He somehow survived, but soon thereafter decided he'd had enough and went home to New York. Al Capone inherited all of Torrio's Chicago operations and moved to consolidate his hold on the beer business. As Capone starts to seek more power, there's a great shakeup in the hierarchy. This sets off a huge gang war and the public begins to see shootouts on Michigan Avenue, and suddenly, it's like Dodge City here. Newspapers every day screaming with headlines. Bullets flying, cars driving by, and, and light of the machine gun flashing from the window. And suddenly, he's in the spotlight. He seems to like the spotlight. I don't want trouble. I don't want bloodshed. But I'm going to protect myself. When somebody strikes at me, I'm going to strike back. I'm the boss. In September of 1926, Jaime Weiss led a deadly convoy of 11 sedans through the suburb of Cicero. Firing more than a 1,000 rounds into Capone's headquarters there and hitting several innocent passers-by. Capone was unhurt. No one was arrested. Three weeks later, in broad daylight, in front of Holy Name Cathedral in downtown Chicago, 
Capone's men machine gunned Weiss to death and wounded three of his lieutenants. Again, no one dared make an arrest. 76 mobsters would be shot or stabbed or bludgeoned to death in Chicago by the end of 1926. 54 more would die in 1927. I don't want to encourage the business, the chief of police told a reporter, but if somebody has to be killed, it's a good thing the gangsters are murdering themselves. It saves trouble for the police. Jurors and judges and prosecutors were paid off. Gang members refused to talk. Intimidated witnesses developed what was called Chicago amnesia. None of the killers was ever sent to jail. The city today, wrote the Literary Digest, symbolizes murder galore and crime unpunished. One senator demanded that President Coolidge withdraw U.S. Marines from Nicaragua and send them to Chicago. The New York mobster Lucky Luciano visited the city and pronounced it a real goddamn crazy place. Nobody's safe in the street. For just a couple of years there, 26 and 27, it, it almost lives up to the hype, these, these incredible violent acts. It's Capone's doing. It's his quest for power. With most of his enemies dead or driven out of town, Capone decided it was time to call for a truce in the beer wars. We're making a shooting gallery out of a great business, and nobody's profiting by it. It's hard and dangerous work. And when a fellow works hard at any line of business, he wants to go home and forget it. He doesn't want to be afraid to sit near a window or open a door. There's plenty of beer business for everybody. Why kill each other over it? Everything seemed to be going Capone's way. In 1927, his old ally, the Republican ex-mayor, Big Bill Thompson, decided to run again, promising an end to police raids that seemed only to affect thirsty working people and leave the big shots untouched. When I'm elected, we will not only reopen places these people have closed, Thompson promised, but we'll open 10,000 new ones. No copper will invade your home and fan your mattress for a hip flask. Capone gave Thompson an estimated quarter of a million dollars to run his campaign. The Republican won by a landslide. Capone hung a portrait of Thompson between images of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln on his office wall. He could now afford to be magnanimous about law enforcement. I got nothing against the honest cop on the beat, he explained. You just have them transferred someplace where they can't do you any harm. There's no real reason why he should become the most famous gangster in American history. He's not that different from dozens, maybe hundreds of others who are doing the same kind of criminal activity. I think the key difference is that he liked attention. He was the first media hound, the first publicity addict among the great gangsters. And he invited the newspaper reporters for interviews. Most gangsters did their best to stay out of sight. Al Capone held press conferences at which he presented himself as what he called a public benefactor who offered Chicago citizens the light pleasures they wanted. When I sell liquor, it's bootlegging, he said. When my patrons serve it on a silver tray on Lakeshore Drive, it's hospitality. He got to be very popular because he was one of the few gangsters that spent money. The rest of them threw half dollars around like they were sewer covers. Capone gave everybody money, including the newspaper reporters. Capone's idea was that everybody reads the newspapers, and most people are stupid enough to believe what's written in the newspapers. There was a great media war underway at the time. Hearst was expanding to Chicago and other cities, and he was doing it by making his papers splashier than the others. And the newspaper writers who discovered these gangsters were rewarded. They became stars of their newspapers because these were great stories that people couldn't get enough of. 
he felt like by elevating himself in this way, by making himself famous in the way that Babe Ruth was more than a baseball player, but he was a celebrity, in making himself famous in that way, he would somehow rise above the, 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 the muck and make himself into a public figure, and he would, might be accepted that way, that he might have a better chance of operating in the long run as this prohibition businessman. Capone became one of the best-known Americans on Earth. He signed autographs at Cubs and White Sox games, played Santa Claus at a nearby parochial school, and gave away $100,000 worth of baubles every Christmas. School children ran after his limousine as it slid through the streets. 18 bodyguards surrounded him when he turned up at the fights, or the opera, or the racetrack. Tour buses rolled past the Metropole Hotel, his new Chicago headquarters, where he had rented two floors and 50 rooms from which to run a growing empire of prostitution and gambling, racketeering, and his biggest source of money, booze. Newspaper readers couldn't get enough of Al Capone. I think in the middle of Capone's reign, it's a very complicated relationship that the public has. It's not that he's a bad guy, that he's a super villain. They see him as a human being who happens to be in this illegal racket, but it's also a racket that nobody really, I mean, nobody really supports prohibition, so they can't really hate Capone too much. And for the most part, there's never a clear murder that you can pin on him. So people at least have this feeling that maybe he's above it all somehow. And of course, he's got a piece of everything at this point. Not a lot of businesses in Chicago are not in some way connected to Capone. You know, every delivery driver, every dry cleaning business is, is connected to Capone. He's everywhere now. His tentacles are reaching everywhere. As Capone diversified, he nonetheless cautioned everyone against investing in the booming stock market. It's a racket, he said. My dad ran two very large hotels in Chicago. The principal one was the Stevens Hotel. They were successful in persuading the Canners Convention to come to Chicago. He and the manager of another hotel in Chicago thought it was very important that there not be an awful lot of crime in the city at the time of the, of the convention. So they had the bright idea of going to see Al Capone. And they told him how important it would be for Chicago not to have crime while the Canners were in town. And uh, Capone said he understood the purpose of it, and it's a certainly reasonable request, and he'd do what he could do to help out. And my dad said there wasn't a single holdup in the city of Chicago for the week the canners were there. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but he told me that story on more than one occasion. 